Hi everyone. We all know there's two types of people in the world. People who say data and people who wish they said data, but who say data. All right, I just want to show you this little uh, nugget as well to start off with. I'm sure you have someone in your life who has said this before. So today we're talking about data, not data, data. And as we talk about data, I guess first of all, we need to understand what data is. So here we go, data. And data is really just collecting facts and statistics. So when we say data, that's what we mean. We mean facts and statistics. And of course, there's different types of data. There um, can be data like if you're doing a survey on people's favorite desserts, and so you'd have different categories, you know, apple pie, creme brulee, going the wrong way, I don't know if it's green, um, ice cream, things like that. Then there's data we might do, like how many cars are passing by the school every hour, and so that would be numerical data, so we'd be collecting numbers as we count that. And so I'll get you to draw this with me. We're just going to make a bit of a visual summary of these different types of data. So over here, we've got categorical, and that's like we said, where we can um, put our data into categories. And then over here, we've got numerical. So there are two types of data. But then, even within these, there are more types of data. So, first of all, if we think about category data, so data that can be put into, like we said, categories, it might be maybe even eye colour, so blue eyes, green eyes, not red eyes, that would be evil, wouldn't it? But you get the idea. Uh, so, the first type of categorical data is called nominal. And then the other one is called ordinal. So nominal data isn't ordered. It's um, just put in whatever order it happens to be in. So say here, not ordered. And so for an example, uh, you might have done a survey of the suburbs that people live in, and it's just the suburbs as they appear, um, maybe by the amount of people that live in suburb the most to the least, or some other sort of order, but it might just be a random order as well. So we'll put here uh, suburbs that people live in. So ordinal data is data that is ordered. Um, so let's just write that over here, ordered. And for example, that might be something like in a survey where you're asked a question and you know, you've know you got like the, the little boxes and it's like strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, something like that where the, the data is then ordered. So we'll put here, um, for example, survey responses, strongly agree to strongly disagree, something like that. That would be an example of ordinal data. Over on the other side here, we've got um, our numerical data still, and this also has two categories. I'm just gonna have to uh, shuffle these across a bit here. So, <clears throat> first of all, there's discrete data, and the other one is called continuous. So there are two categories of data which are numerical. So again, numerical means that we are dealing with numbers. <coughs> so with discrete data, that's data that we count. And the discrete part of the name sort of means you're locked into certain numbers that you can choose. So if we're doing a survey of how many cars are in the staff car park, we only have certain numbers that we can have as our answers, like one car, three cars, 10 cars, and so on. 
We can't have two and a half cars. We can't have 3.5, seven cars. We're locked into those whole numbers. So discrete data is data uh, that we count. Uh, I'll change colors again here. So, so we count, um, for example, cars in car park. So you can't have half a car, can you? And that relates to a whole bunch of other stuff too, particularly to do with people. So you can't have half a person. So um, if you're doing, you know, like the government does a census every five years and so they get a lot of data about people and a lot of that data will be discrete data because you can't be talking about half a person. All right, continuous data on the other hand, this is data that we measure. So continuous data is measured. And so continuous data can be any number. It can be a decimal number as well. And so anything to do with measurement, time, length, weight, volume, all that sort of stuff is continuous data. And so we might be doing uh, a survey to see how far you can jump. So we'll say uh, distance jumped. And you can imagine for that, you could get a whole range of different answers. So you might get like, 2.1 meters, but then you could get 2.11 meters, and then 2.111 meters, and it sort of goes on and on and on, doesn't it, depending on how accurate you are with your measurements. So that's a bit of an overview of the types of data. So this is all still to do with facts and statistics, but we can think about it in different ways, depending on what we're doing. And of course, depending on the type of data it is, we then would graph it differently, we would interpret it differently, we would use different sorts of calculations to try and understand it. So to get all this data in the first place, um, you can either get it yourself or you can get someone else to get it for you. And so if you get it yourself, we would say that's primary data because you've gone and collected it yourself. You've seen how it was collected. You know how it was collected. Uh, if you get secondary data, that can still be very reliable, very accurate, but you don't always know how they collected it, what sort of bias maybe was done in the way that they got it, and so uh, you need to do a bit more investigating yourself just to make sure you understand how the data was collected, what sort of data it is, all that sort of stuff. So when you're collecting it yourself, there's, there's a way, a number of ways you can do that. You can um, just observe, you know, you're doing an experiment in science, you're looking and you see some stuff happen and so you record that data yourself. You can uh, get stuff on your phone, can't you? you can do surveys on your phone, you can again Google stuff on the internet with your phone. Uh, online research is a big thing now and you can get a whole bunch of stuff online but again how was it done, um, where did it come from, what was the reason they were doing that experiment or that survey in the first place, they're all important questions to ask. Uh, sometimes you can collect data yourself just by giving handouts to people, physical handouts, and then other times you can get data yourself by you know, a face-to-face -face sort of meeting. So obviously at the moment we're in the middle of a, a big change, aren't we, with society with this coronavirus, and so uh, this would be off the cards at the moment, no face-to-face. -face. Um, even doing like a printed one, couldn't really do that at the moment, could we, because uh, we want to try and minimise that contact between people. So doing an observation yourself would be fine uh, or else we're sort of limited to doing online surveys or online research. So let's take a look at some uh, real data. And this is data which is current as of today, 20th of March 2020. And so this is from the ABC website. And so this shows the total cases of coronavirus per state and territory at the moment. So you can see over here in New South Wales, they've got the most, 307, and then it works its way down. Here we are, Tassie, we're currently at 10 official cases. And so looking at that, um, it looks pretty clear, doesn't it? The New South Wales is the hardest hit state at the moment with the virus. And then probably these ones, WA, South Australia, Tassie ACT uh, are the least affected. But that's just the total number of cases. And so if we stop to think for a minute, 
why is New South Wales got the most number of cases? Is it because they're not following the social isolation and the social distancing uh, procedures, recommendations? Or is there another reason why they have the most number of cases? And so if we look at this next graph, which shows the same data, but now we've broken it down to uh, the amount of cases for every 100,000 people. So this is sort of showing us for every 100,000 people in your state, this is how many people uh, have um, been diagnosed with coronavirus. And so you can see New South Wales is still the highest, 3.8. And, you know, if you want to analyze the data, there's a whole bunch of reasons why that is. You know, they've got our major international airport, they've got the biggest population, and so there's a whole bunch of factors. But what's interesting about these two graphs is this second half. So if we look particularly um, Victoria through to South Australia, and this graph, there's a big difference, isn't there? Victoria, Queensland are on par up here, and then WA, South Australia, there's a big drop down to them. But when we look at the infection rate for every 100,000, you'd almost say these four, and probably Tassie included, are very similar. They all have roughly the same amount of cases for every 100,000 people that live there. And so if we just looked at the first graph, remember these are examples of secondary data. So if we just looked at the first graph, we'd say, oh, Tassie's doing fine, you know, only 10 cases. Um, you know, we've got nothing to worry about. Look at New South Wales, they're, they're, they're struggling. Look at Queensland, um, they're struggling. But when we break it down to how many cases for every 100,000 people, we only have 500,000 people in Tassie. And so that means we roughly have two cases for every 100,000 people that live here. And that is actually not far off how those other states are tracking. So that is important information for governments to have, for policymakers to have, because that can then inform their decisions about, well, actually, no, we need to be more proactive in trying to limit this virus. And so that's what the governments are doing. That's why they've introduced the, the ban now on visitors coming into Tasmania. You've got to self-isolate for 14 days uh, because they're looking at data like this and saying, well, actually, we probably do need to be doing more. Even though we only have 10 official cases, it could quickly uh, escalate because we're actually similar to the other states and they're watching what's happening in those other states. Let's look at another example and this is not virus related. So here I've got some statistics for you. I'm just going to check my camera. Still working. So here we've got some statistics uh, on road deaths from the different states. And so my question to you is looking at that table of data, which state is the most dangerous to drive in? Have a think about it, pause the video for a minute, I want you to make a prediction about looking at that data, which state is the most dangerous state for you to drive in? Alright, so just looking at the sheer numbers, again New South Wales tops the list, we've already said how they're the most populated state, so that could just be because they have more drivers there, more chances of having crashes. So we want to explore again to see if some of these lower numbers are actually accurate in how we're looking at that data. So when we look at that, it looks like they're safer states because they don't have as many crashes. Is that the right interpretation? Or do we need to uh, dig into the data a bit deeper to find out if that is the right conclusion? So let's look at uh, the same data, but now Similar to the coronavirus data, this is uh, road deaths per 100,000 people. So this is for every 100,000 people that live there in New South Wales, there are 5.7 deaths uh, for road crashes. And if we have a look down the table, South Australia up to 6, WA 9, Tassie 8. So these are all higher than New South Wales. Northern Territory. 34. So look back at the original table, 75 deaths in total, but because they don't have a big population, they actually have 34 deaths for every 100,000 people that live there, which is a lot higher than the other states and territories, isn't it? And if we take that one step further and add in this table, so this table then shows us the deaths for every 
10,000 vehicles that are registered. Because again, just based on population, not everyone has a car, do they? Particularly in cities, a lot of people don't have cars. A lot of people use public transport. And so road deaths, um, compared to actually how many people are on the roads driving, is a useful comparison to make to help us understand the data better. So looking at this again, we've still got our top row there showing the total number of deaths, but if we compare that to how many people are actually driving, New South Wales is not quite the lowest, but they're, they're almost there. Them and Victoria uh, are below, below one, so less than one death for every 100,000, uh, less than one death for every 10,000 vehicles registered. Coming along, uh, Northern Territory tops the list, you know, they're, they're way up there on six, and Tassie as well is actually probably one of the worst states. Even though we're, we're much better than Northern Territory, we're still probably in that bottom half of road deaths. So hopefully that's a good example just to show you that when we read data, when we try and interpret data, it's really important to know uh, the whole story, not just to, to cherry pick facts and statistics from different places because you can come to the wrong conclusion if you do that. And so having a better idea of what type of data it is, where it's come from, how it was collected, are all really important things to know for your decision making. And also, I guess, for governments and, and businesses as well, if they're using this.